All right, uh, chapter five, network cabling. It's a um, tricky little chapter for us to do because this is normally our hands-on chapter where you know you'll be sitting there with making cables and everything. But uh, we've done our best uh, in light of the uh, the current uh, situation to get you guys uh, what we feel um, is going to get you through the uh, through the chapter and get some good solid background. Uh, we will always have some goals we want to accomplish here. Explain the basic data transmission concepts. We're going to talk about throughput, uh, problems that might occur with uh, transmission. And we're going to look at the different types of cabling, uh, the limitations of different media. Um, and then, as always, come back into and hit our troubleshooting chapter. Now, uh, if we try to just like as I've, as I've done throughout the curriculum for you guys, if we just try to take everything that you and I do before the days when you got into IT and then kind of correlate all of that back to what we already know. And so what we know is how to travel. Um, so just as highways and streets provide the foundation for cars to move about, uh, computer networking media, media is the cable, uh, it gives us the, way, the physical foundation for us to move data from point A to point B, like a highway gives you the ability to move your car from point A to point B. Uh, the first networks that we used, uh, there were thick coax cables, what we call legacy cable. We'll talk about that later. Uh, today, we're typically using uh, copper uh, cabling, such as our category cabling, CAT5, CAT6, uh, CAT7. Uh, or fiber optic cabling, and for most of us in our homes today, we're using uh, wireless communications. Uh, networks are always evolving to try to meet the uh, demand for greater speed, versatility, and reliability, and network media technologies are changing uh, rapidly all the time. Um, There's some things that we're going to have to uh, talk about the uh, the uh, what makes our network more efficient, what's going to get in the way of our networking. And it comes down to the first two terms that we need to understand. And a lot of people look at these two terms and they always make them the same. Bandwidth and throughput, uh, although they are typically interchangeable for a great number of, uh, of, uh, of people, in the, uh, or I would say the user. Uh, as technicians, we would need to understand that bandwidth and throughput are actually different. So as a professional, you need to know these two characteristics. One, bandwidth is the amount of data that could theoretically be transmitted during a given period of time. So in an analogy, the bandwidth for a three-lane uh, highway is the number of vehicles that can pass a checkpoint in one minute when traffic is bumper to bumper and traveling at the maximum speed limit. In practice, um, that bandwidth never really happens. Still, we would increase the potential bandwidth by adding more lanes to the freeway. At the same time, considering the, that adding too many lanes uh, for that amount of anticipated traffic. So some lanes would never get used, which would then waste our overall resources. And we've got something called throughput. Uh, also called the payload uh, rate or effective data rate. Uh, it's a measure of how much data is actually transmitted over a given period of time. So in the analogy, throughput measures the actual traffic of a three-lane highway uh, that passes in one minute. Using all the available bandwidth would then result in more accidents and traffic jams than if the bandwidth exceeds the actual throughput just by a little bit. However, the beneficial effect would be limited, providing a lot more potential bandwidth than actual throughput. Um, so another way, as I always try to tell people, we measure our bandwidth in megahertz. We measure our throughput in the amount of data that travels ac across the circuit. Uh, so, for example, my bandwidth might be 550 megahertz for my CAT6 cable, where my throughput might be gigabit. That's the main difference as a technician that you would want to get out of that. Okay. What's also important to understand and to remember 
is <clears throat> we measure throughput in bits per second, lowercase b. So notice here, uh, we have a lowercase b in all of these terms, okay? So we have a bit per second, kilobit per second, megabit per second, uh, gigabit per second, uh, and then terabit per second. The reason you want to make sure that you understand the difference is throughput is in bandwidth. We measure those in bits per second. We measure storage in bytes per second, which is eight times the amount. So your hard drive might be a gigabyte hard drive, but your speed is gigabit. Some of the problems that we could have on our lines are noise. Uh, noise could be electromagnetic interference that you might get from uh, a machine. Uh, it's measured in decibels. And we get in serious detail on decibels when we talk. Um, <clears throat> sorry, when we, when we uh, go into the wireless class. Uh, electromagnetic interference caused by motors, caused by power lines, caused by TVs, copying machines, fluorescent lights, microwave ovens. Um, all that can cause an electromagnetic interference, which is similar uh, to radio frequency interference. Um, which is caused by radio waves. Strong broadcast signals from a radio or TV antenna can generate uh, radio frequency interference. Uh, crosstalk is a phenomenon uh, that occurs when we have the uh, electricity uh, going down one, one wire, okay, which causes an electromagnetic field around that cable. That electromagnetic field is now interfering with the data on the neighboring cable, which is also creating an electromagnetic field. So what ends up happening is crosstalk uh, can essentially just destroy the data on its neighboring pairs. So our solution to that would be to, if you've seen the twisted pair cable, and the reason it's called twisted pair is we twist the wires together, thus canceling out the electromagnetic fields on each individual uh, cable. There's different types of crosstalk that we have. We have alien crosstalk, which occurs between just two cables. We have near-end crosstalk, which occurs uh, between wire pairs near the source of the data signal. And then, of course, if you've got at the, no at the source, you're going to have some at the far end. Uh, where the cable uh, terminates, and that would be called far end crosstalk. In every signal, there is always going to be a certain amount of noise. It is unavoidable. However, engineers have devised a way uh, to limit the uh, potential for noise uh, degradation. Uh, one way simply to ensure would be to uh, twist the cables. Okay, Proper cable design and installation are critical. Uh, another thing that's going to cause us issues is something we call attenuation. Simple definition for attenuation, the weakening of a signal over time and distance. Okay, uh, After a period of time, the signal just gets too weak, can't, can't hear it anymore. Uh, so we might have to put a repeater in, which would then clean up and amplify our signal. It's much easier to clean up and amplify a, a digital signal than it is to clean up and amplify an analog signal. The length of a cable is always going to come into uh, into play, uh, which is why different cables are going to have uh, different limitations. Uh, fiber optics versus copper cable. Um, <clears throat> the other terms we need to know, one of them, uh, the most common measure of, uh, of, of for latency, I should say, uh, latency is time. It is the delay it takes from uh, signal to get from point A to point B. The time it takes for signal to get from point A to point B and back again is what's something we call our round trip time. What would cause latency, obviously, is the length of our cable and the type of cable. Uh, the length of a cable for, say, twisted pair of copper it maxes out at 100 meters, whereas the length of a cable for uh, coax cable, which is considered legacy cable, can be anywhere from 185 meters to 500 meters, and we can have length of a cable for 
fiber optic going up to six miles. So all that is going to come into play and then have a different effector on our round, on our uh, our speeds and our latency. If uh, packets experience varying amounts of delay, uh, which means it's not always going to be the same, they can arrive out of order. Uh, when our packets arrive out of order, this phenomenon is called jitter um, or packet delay variation. Um, it might, might cause streaming video or voice transmission to pause repeatedly, maybe jump around, stall out completely. Uh, another latency related problem occurs if the uh, if the node does not receive the rest of the data stream uh, within a given period of time. Uh, therefore, assume no more data is coming. In this case, transmission would just uh, put error out. Uh, so noise and attenuation and latency uh, degrade of a network's efficiency are some of the changes that uh, we can make on a network to increase our efficiency. Um, one of the first things you want to look at is the actual network card itself. The network card itself can be set um, based on direction. We could have half duplex, which means I can communicate once one way. So think of that would be like uh, a walkie talkie. Whereas you push a button in on your end uh, and you transmit your message to somebody. Uh, someone on the other then would hear your message, wait for your signal to be over, they would press the button on their device and they would communicate back to you. The problem with that is if both both uh, sender and uh, receiver were to click their buttons at the same time to communicate, the there would be no communication because only one user can send and one can receive at a time, as opposed to a full duplex, which gives us the ability to send and receive at the same time. Then there's also something called simplex, Simplex means it's kind of like a broadcast over a uh, public address system where it is uh, one signal going one way, there's no communication going back the other way. Those settings can actually be set up in, uh, in Device Manager. Uh, I've been using this uh, for troubleshooting purposes quite often. Uh, a lot of times on my, uh, I can set it up here for a wired connection or for wireless connection, I will, might even have in here uh, preferred signals 2.4 gigahertz, no preferred uh, 5 gigahertz. Okay. Next we want to discuss would be something called uh, multiplexing. Now multiplexing really is nothing more than the ability to take multiple uh, transmissions and put them on the line at one time uh, simultaneously, which gives us the ability to you know, bundle up our data, send it out on the line. We keep it separate through a little something called guard band, which we'll talk more about in the 260 class. And um, we have different types of uh, methods of combining our signals, and we can do them by time. Okay. <clears throat> Here, we'll divide the channel into multiple intervals, uh, or what we call time slots. They're reserved. The designated nodes, regardless of whether the node has any data to transmit or not, um, it is an inefficient or can be inefficient, uh, especially for nodes that aren't doing a lot of transmitting. We can have statistical time division, which assigns time slots to nodes um, similar to time division, but uh, it'll adjust the slots according to priority and need. Okay, uh, this approach uses all slots rather than leaving some unused, which would then maximize your overall bandwidth. But then we also have frequency division multiplexing. Now this assigns different frequencies to create multiple frequency bands. Each would then be used by a subchannel. So that mul so so that this way multiple signals can then be transmitted on the line at the same time. They'll be modulated into uh, different frequencies and then multiplexed to Simultaneously, you travel over the signal, uh, the single channel, and then when they get to the other end, since we we uh, used a multiplexer to get them on the line, we're going to use what's called a demultiplexer on the other end to break the signals back apart when they get to their destination, and then we can parse them out to where they all need to go. <clears throat> the three types of multiplexing: one is wave division multiplexing that we use for a fiber optic cable. Um, 
It works with uh, any fiber, carries multiple light signals simultaneously by dividing a light beam into different wavelengths or colors on a single uh, fiber. This technology works similar to how uh, PRISM would say uh, divide white light into a bunch of different various colors. Uh, the original um, wave division multiplexing gave us uh, only two wavelengths or channels per strand of fiber. So then we moved on to what's called dense wave division multiplexing. It increased the number of channels provided by normal uh, wave division multiplexing to between 80 and 320 channels as opposed to uh, two. Now, dense WDM can be amplified uh, in route and then is typically used on high bandwidth or long distance uh, WAN links, such as the uh, connection between, uh, say, a large ISP and then maybe the network service provider itself. The coarse uh, wavelength division multiplexing uh, lowers the cost by spacing frequency bands wider apart, allows for a cheaper transceiver. Uh, and then, of course, uh, WDM multiplexers can typically support 4, 8, 16, or even 18 channels per fiber line. So you can see uh, on the uh, manufacturer's website uh, the effective distances for coarse WDM uh, is more limited because the signal would not be amplified. Uh, monitoring and optimizing uh, network performance is a substantial part of network administration, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. Next thing we want to discuss with you is, is, uh, is copper cabling. Okay, The first copper that we use is something that many of you are familiar with. It's what comes into your house and gives you your cable TV, gives you your internet. All of our data is coming in over top of that, that center copper core. We then have a PVC or Teflon tube going around it to help protect it. The braided shielding here is for grounding. It absorbs any electromagnetic interference or radio frequency interference. It kind of like draws it in like an antenna. And then it is then sent to the earth ground where we want it to be. <clears throat> Other type of cabling that we use is twisted pair. This is the uh, type of cabling that most of us are familiar with today. Uh, real quick, one thing I want to cover before we move off of uh, our, our, our uh, coax will be the two types of coax that we normally find. Um, we have an RG59, which is a very thin, it's a 20 to 22 AWG. AWG is the American wire gauge. So if you've ever held a pair of wire strippers, uh, you would see that they have different size holes uh, in the wire stripper based on the different size of the copper wire. Uh, the higher the number is, a, the smaller the, the, uh, the size of the copper. So we're looking at a 20 or a 22 for, <clears throat> sorry, for your data cabling. And if we were to take a look at say like what we have to run electricity in our home, you're typically looking at a 12 or a 14, very thick. Uh, we also use an RG6 is what we normally see coming in for your cable television. Um, that is an 18 uh, AWG, still thicker than, um, much thicker than our uh, data cabling. And the, the standard type of connector that we would use for our uh, data cabling for coax is also called a BNC connector. Um, being it's crimped on or compressed or twisted onto the coax cable stands for bayonet Neil uh, Kanselman. Uh, it's a term used to both an older style or um, newer style connector. Sometimes we would call them the British Naval connectors. That's how I always learned it. Okay, so now back over back over to our Ethernet cable, twisted pair cabling, uh, <clears throat> sometimes called fast Ethernet. Fast Ethernet cabling is um, for 100 meg networks. Today, most of us run on gigabit networks. Uh, your twisted pair cabling is four pairs. Uh, 
of cable. The uh, American wire gauge for these is typically going to be 20 to 24 um, of the American wire gauge and uh, two wires of the same type color. So you have your orange and white orange will be twisted together. Um, and they are all at different twists per inch or per foot. If we were to look at our most uh, or most common types of cabling, CAT3 and CAT5 today are considered our obsolete cables. Uh, CAT3 got us up to a whopping 10 meg per second. Um, in many cases, they were only operating at 4 meg per second. CAT5 is not in production anymore today. Got us up to the 100 meg barrier, but most of the time we were kicking in at, um, at 10, where we hit CAT5E. Uh, which we can still purchase today, but most of us, everything we're purchasing today is 6 and 6A. CAT5E was our first leap into the gigabit category. CAT6 got us to leap into the 10 gig category uh, and included a plastic core in the inside of our wire to separate our four pair of wires, plus the wires have more twists per foot, plus the wires are typically of a higher... Um, or of a uh, higher quality copper. Um, and those are typically in up to 250 megahertz for their bandwidth. CAT6A, 10 gig, 500 to 600 megahertz in bandwidth. Will you see those listed on the side of your boxes. Um, we have shielded twisted pair as well. Shielded twisted pair um, is definitely gonna find with your CAT7s where they actually have foil that wraps each individual pair or you can have shielded twisted pair that would um, wrap around all four pair at one shot. Um, this is to help with the, to guarantee a little more immunity to electromagnetic interference. There's your, there's a graphic of your standard uh, data cable. Shielded twisted pairs I mentioned earlier, um, <clears throat> would have the, uh, the grounding cable on the outside. Not used as uh, much today. We're finding today that if we're really having problems with uh, electromagnetic um, interference, we would just run a uh, fiber optics. Fiber optics has increased in the um, uh, in its proliferation in computer networks because of the uh, it has gone down in um, in cost for installation. If we were to take a look at this graphic here, you can see the different types of uh, cabling as we've evolved through. Um, we have a PVC grade, and here we're talking about the actual sheathing of the cable itself. The different types of sheathing uh, on the outside um, will vary based on the application. Uh, for in this case here, this is our plenum grade. So if I were to put this up into the ceiling of my of my of my building, the plenum is the return air duct. So we don't forget about fresh air going up through here. It's uh, going to be less flammable. Okay. Uh, Cat six, as you can see, has that plastic divider. It is a much more thick and rigid, a little more difficult to install than our Cat five cablings. If we were to compare throughput. Uh, of STP versus uh, UTP, they're going to be the same. Uh, the cost of STP is higher uh, than UTP only because of the of the, um, of the uh, added shielding and the cost of insulation would also increase because there's also they're both used in RJ45 jack, but there's going to be metal grounding in the RJ45. Uh, connector as well. STP is more noise resistant than UTP. Okay. And but both of them have a maximum uh, cable length of 100 meters. For both of them, you're going to have to concern yourself with proper termination. You're going to either use 568A or 568B. This is nothing more than the pattern of the uh, cable. So if I'm going to go with 568A, it's going to go white green because there's four pair of wires. So there's a green pair with white, there's an orange pair with white, a brown pair with white, and a blue pair with white. 
So if we're doing 568A, it would be uh, white, green, green, uh, white, orange, blue, white, blue, orange, white, brown, brown. And if we're going to do the B, it's going to be white, orange, orange, white, green, blue, white, blue, green, white, brown, brown. You'll notice on both of those, uh, we just switched the orange and the green pair. Blue was always directly dead center in the middle because back in the old days, that's where we used to have our telephone lines. So <clears throat> here's my 568A connection. Okay. What's most important is if you have a straight through patch cable, you have to have 568A on, the, on one side and 568A on the other side, or 568B on one side and 568B on the other. It has to be the same on both sides. If I go A to B, A to B is strictly for crossover cables where we connect dissimilar devices. If we're going to connect similar devices, we're going to use uh, a straight through patch cable. Okay. A rollover cable is, it's A, uh, you do 568A on one side, you, you basically wire it up the exact opposite on the other. So what I like to tell people is you slide your connector on one side, one way, you do the wiring the exact same on the opposite side, but instead of taking your connector and putting it on perfect, you just flip your connector over and slide it on. You roll your connector over. Those are used for console cables and for uh, configuration of devices. Okay. Power over Ethernet. Power over Ethernet is the ability for us to actually transmit uh, electricity over our lines so that we can um, power devices, devices such as maybe a camera or a device such as a wireless access point. Uh, believe it or not, we when we used to run wireless networks uh, before using PoE, before it became so common, we would actually have to have an electrician work with us where they would put a, an electrical outlet in the ceiling directly next to where we were going to uh, place our data cable for an access point. The power over Ethernet gives us the ability to... Um, to uh, uh, su supply different types of, or different uh, amounts of, of uh, power. Uh, the standard power was 15.4 watts. Uh, power over Ethernet came out in uh, 2003. Specifies uh, a method for us to supply electrical power over the twisted pair connection. We can't do high voltage here. We can only do low voltage. So we have to max it out at 25 and a half watts um, <clears throat> for, uh, or newer PoE devices. Uh, if you don't have a PoE device, say for example, if you have, a, you can have a switch that does power over Ethernet. So what happens is when you plug your uh, your device into the switch, the first thing the switch does before it um, starts transmitting data is it checks to find out based on firmware to find out if your device requires power. If it does require power, then it will determine how much power it gets and it will feed that device. If it doesn't require power, it'll turn off the PoE function and just start supplying data. Uh, you need to have Cat5e or Cat5 cable or better. Okay. The IEEE standard requires that a PSE device first determine whether a node is PoE capable, as I just said before. Now, if you don't have a switch, for example, that does power over Ethernet like this one here, and you have a non-PoE switch, you can get something what they call an injector, which plugs, uh, it'll plug into, say, at the source of the wall port, and then you plug your data line into that, and then it sends data over the line. So this plugs into my wall port here, my data coming in, and then data coming out. So basically, this is the same device. They just flipped it around for you so you can see it, okay? Um, uh, uh, other things we want to take a look at here is the um, is uh, for your standard cables category 5e or 6 will determine the fastest network speed that it can support. Uh, it is layer one because it is media. Okay. Um, different uh, different types of networks will be will be uh, just learn your names of them will be specific for their speed. So for example, if I have a 100 base T fast ethernet, so 
uh, what they call fast Ethernet, so you know it's 100 meg. 1,000 base T, okay, T for twisted pair, baseband transmission, 1,000 base, 1,000 means it's going to be gigabit Ethernet. And then we have 10G base T, baseband uh, Ethernet, um, twisted pair, and you can go 10 gig per second. Doesn't matter about speed, they all go the same distance, 100 um, to 100, me 100 meters. Uh, what's also important to understand, in order for us to get to the 1,000 base T, you can go all the way up to, uh, you can have CAT 5E, CAT, uh, which is preferred. 10 gig, you can get, you have to have CAT 6A, A stands for augmented, or you CAT 7. Me personally, I've only ever read about CAT 7. Uh, I have, a, I know a great number of people who do uh, cabling for a career and they never use CAT 7. If they need to hit those kind types of numbers, they will always put in fiber. One of the important things you want to understand is, is that these uh, cables, uh, it's all about how many pairs of the wires they're using. Fast Ethernet is only using four out of the eight, eight wires, whereas the um, 1000 base and 10 base are actually using all eight wires in order to, to hit their gig speeds. <clears throat> fiber optic cabling is going to be either uh, glass or plastic on the uh, as their core for their conductor. It uses light uh, to travel across, and as we know, light is going to be faster than electricity. Um, what's under what's important to understand is we light doesn't bend. Okay, so we have to reflect or refract the light, and the light, the uh, the re reflection and refraction of the light as it goes around the uh, the cable, the core, is because it's going to be reflecting off of what's called the cladding, which not only is there for reflection and refraction, but it is also there to help protect the uh, the glass pieces. Okay, uh, this. Glass here, the reason you can see this is because there is a 125 micron cladding surrounding this glass right here. We would actually uh, strip that cladding off. Because right now I could bend that this piece of glass without issue uh, to a certain point where it then would eventually snap. But if I take that cladding off, it will become much more uh, brittle. What's also important is, is here I have, um, these are measured in microns. So it's going to be either four to eight for single mode, or uh, fifty to sixty-two point five in uh, single mode fiber. This is typically going to be a nine hundred mic uh, microns here of uh, insulation or cladding that goes around the sheathing, and then this here, this uh, yellow or blonde colored hair is um, Kevlar. Um, this helps strengthen and protect the fibers. Uh, why should I go to copper? Why should I go to fiber? Well, for one, it's not as expensive as it used to be. It is still more expensive than than, uh, than copper, but it's not as expensive as it once was. But the big benefit of copper or of um, fiber over is the, the high throughput. It can do 10 gigs sitting down without any issues. Uh, it's not susceptible at all to um, electromagnetic interference. It's not gonna get hit by a lightning strike. Excellent security, you can't tap into it. You try to tap into it, you'll just break the glass. Um, and it's able to carry signals over a much longer distance. It is not stuck to that 100 meter. Uh, yes, it is more expensive, but in the grand scheme of things, with the way that our networks today are scaling, uh, it's really not that bad. Um, and, but you do have to have special equipment to um, to splice it. Uh, Speed-wise, we're hitting speeds of uh, of 100 gig and higher today with um, with fiber optic cabling. As of, out of our all of our transmissions, yeah, it probably is the most expensive to install, but it is unaffected by EMI, and we can go up to 40,000 meters. So you're looking miles um, as opposed to um, you know, 100 meters, a football field, okay? There are different types, as we said. We have multi-mode and we have single-mode fiber. Uh, 
Multi-mode fiber is our slower fiber. It is your typically your 62.5 or 50 microns uh, um, in diameter for the core. The the uh, method of data of getting the data onto the line is typically going to be an LED, uh, which as you know is super bright, can travel super far, but the beam of light is not as focused as would be if it were a laser. Uh, laser is what we use for single mode fiber. Uh, the uh, in the fiber itself is typically going to be eight to ten microns. Uh, today we're finding them as small as four to eight microns in diameter, and which is really like the diameter smaller than a human hair. Uh, we launch the data onto the line. Uh, using a laser so it doesn't have as much reflection and refraction as it travels through it can go faster and for longer um, as it goes down through uh, if this line were to have a curve in it yeah it would then bounce off the side but being narrower okay i can travel faster and further but lace uh, single mode will be more expensive than multi-mode okay. if my multi-mode as you can see my led uh, launches the light going down through so I since I'm bouncing down the line as opposed to a laser which goes straight down the middle I cannot travel as far well technically I am going as far I'm just going more up and down than I am straight through okay. the different types of connectors that we want to make sure we're discussing here um, <clears throat> so if this would be say my ST connector my straight my my straight tip connector we always want to make sure we put the cap on when we're not using them Okay, the light is actually coming out of here, out of what's called this spurl here, which is connected back here through our glass core. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's single mode or multi-mode. Um, the, uh, the light is still going to traverse. Uh, all, the only difference is going to be the launcher that we're using to get to uh, put the data on the line. Um, What's also important, if we go back to the old ways of, of setting up our lines, we actually had to cut, cleave, and polish our lines. This isn't really how we're doing our connections today. Today, we typically will be using um, a splicer, which uh, is literally almost like arc welding the glass together. It's an excellent way to do it as opposed to the old way where we actually have to butt them up or glue them together. Single mode, mode connectors are available in a uh, 1.25 uh, micrometer furl or millimeter furl in this case here. We use 1.25 connectors. Um, LC connectors are the most common that we're using today. Um, <clears throat> allow us to uh, do uh, uh, transmitting and receiving uh, usually in the same port when we use LC connectors. Okay. So this is a, an example of my LC connector. So this is just a 100 meg connection, but what's important to understand that, uh, that we all understand is when we're going in through here, one is transmitting, one is receiving. We do not send and receive on the same glass core. So when we're working with fiber, please remember you need to have a minimum of two cores for sending and receiving. This is what enables us to go from our fiber into our device out to copper state. Maybe that's where your desktop is, okay? But if we take a look at most of our switches today, most of them will have two SFPs or what's called a small form factor pluggable, which will allow you to uh, plug your fiber optic into the switch and then you have your 24 copper ports coming out of those. This is our most common right here. Uh, our small form factor pluggables, they slide into our switch. And then this, you would purchase this based on the type of connector that you're going to um, uh, be using for your particular network. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the ethernet standards for using our fiber. Okay. Gigabit and 10 gig is really what we want to talk about here. But what's important to understand is, is we're going to need to talk about the LXs and the SXs. So if we're to take a look at the table that we have here, 
um, the Ethernet standards, okay, the Thousand Base LX and Thousand Base SX. And the, the Thousand Base SX is a form of gigabit Ethernet, less expensive to install than Thousand Base LX and uses shorter wavelengths of 850 nanometers and see S in its name for SX. The maximum seven length for a thousand base uh, SX depends on two things. What's the diameter of the fiber? Is it, um, is it going to be a uh, single mode or multi-mode? Is it gonna be uh, 50 microns versus 62.5 or four, eight or 10? The modal bandwidth Okay, is a measure of the highest frequency of the single mode of fiber or single signal of a multimode fiber that can support over a specific distance and it's measured in uh, megahertz per kilometer. Uh, it's related to the distortion that occurs when multiple pulses of light, although issued at the same time, arrive at the end of the fiber at slightly different times. Uh, the higher the modal bandwidth, the longer a uh, multi-mode fiber can carry uh, a signal's reliability. Um, therefore, a thousand base uh, uh, SX is best suited for, say, short network runs than a uh, thousand base LX. Uh, for example, connecting a da uh, data center with a data closet in, say, an office building. Uh, some of the problems that you're going to run into with uh, problems with, with uh, fiber is uh, mismatch. Uh, for example, if you've got a connector, when you're putting a connector on the end of a piece of fiber, and you have a multi-mode connector and you put on a single mode, you're going to have fiber mismatch. You actually have different size cores, different widths, and it's just not going to work. Uh, you could have wavelength uh, mismatches. Um, or even uh, one of the ones that I see a lot, which drives me nuts, is dirty connectors. Um, fiber connectors uh, can get dirty. Uh, they make a special tool that we use to clean the dirt or dust. One little speck of dust on a fiber optic connector can just destroy all of your data coming through. Uh, I have too often seen uh, guys grab a fiber connector and blow in it trying to connect it trying to clean it and all they've really done at this point is spit on it okay um if we're going to start doing troubleshooting okay as mr brown always points out first thing you want to look for is that blinkity blink light uh, make sure the lights are blinking um steady light typically on a connector today means that we have a connective we have connection. And then there's usually two lights and the blinking light means that I have uh, activity on the line. Red or amber lights typically would indicate uh, a problem. You'd have to look at the manufacturer specifications because there are times where say an amber light just means that I'm going in a hundred meg, not a gig. So you might wanna look at your at the, the owner's manual as well. Uh, if you think there's a problem with the cable you're using, then you always want to replace it with what's called a known good cable. Okay? Uh, we have something called a fox and a hand that we like to use as a tone generator and an amplifier. So I put an electrical tone out on the line, and it gives me the ability to find the um, find the line. So if, I have, if I'm in my, my classroom and I plug the tone generator uh, into a port, then I go back to the wiring closet and there's 200 wires coming into there. Which one is mine? What if it wasn't labeled right? I, we don't know. What if there's a break in the line? So at this point here, I use the amplifier or what's called the probe. And that allows me to find which individual wire has the actual tone signal on it. Okay. Very common, uh, commonly used. The only big problem that we have with these is at times a signal can be so strong that you're sending out that it actually bleeds over to some of the wires that it's bundled with. So you want to look for the uh, wire that is the longest. So in this case here, okay, I plug this port into my wall port in my classroom. Then I go into the wiring closet and I listen with this one. I press this little wand right here, this probe up against the outside of the cable, and I listen. 
then when I finally think I have the right one, I unplug it from the patch panel and I look for the strongest signal uh, going in. Okay. Very similar right there. Okay. Uh, I can use a multimeter. I personally never used a multimeter to test for uh, cables to look for voltage on, a, on an actual cable. Um, but it, we, for some reason, it's always in here. Um, this allows me to just search for voltages based on a pair. This might be good if you're, say, testing for a PoE, right? Continuity testers, uh, we're going to use a virtual continuity tester in one of the labs for you guys that I have uh, a link for you on the site. Uh, continuity tester, just to make sure that you've got all eight wires matching up to all eight wires on the other end. It's usually a simple pass-fail system, right? There's a simple LED continuity tester. Uh, you can use them for coax or you can use them for CAT5. And what happens is there's just four pair of wires uh, with LED lights right here. And it'll light up green on this side, green on this side. It means you passed. Uh, you can buy digital testers today for $25 on Amazon, which just will tell you wires 1 through 8 over wires 1 through 8. We have actual uh, cable performance testers that we will use in the uh, CNT 140 class. Those would actually not only measure continuity, it'll tell you distance of the cable, so how long the cable is, and it'll measure near end and far end crosstalk for you as well. The certifiers are typically very expensive pieces of equipment, um, uh, running anywhere from seven to ten thousand uh, dollars for a certification tester. Uh, certification testers, as I mentioned earlier, also measure uh, distance, and what they use is a time domain reflector. So it sends a signal out on the line. The signal gets to the end of its destination, bounces back. The time uh, that it took to get from point A to point B and back again uh, will then be crunched uh, through an algorithm, and it will tell you the approximate uh, length of the cable. This is very handy, especially if you know that you have a cable say that it's supposed to be 70 meters in length and you run a test on it and it says that the uh, the cable is uh, one meter in length or 25 meters in length. If it says it's one meter in length, then chances are that the problem is right at the port where it plugs in. Uh, if it says it's 35 meters in length, that means that there's a cut in the line and you have to go find the break. Optical Optical time domain reflector is the same thing, but it just does it for uh, fiber optics versus copper. Okay, TDR, copper, OTDR, fiber optic does the same thing. Extremely expensive. Um, we're talking probably around seventeen thousand dollars for one of these. Okay, uh, the the light meters measure the amount of light that's coming down the line. Sometimes you can actually have too much. Um, fiber optic just too much strength in the light coming down, which makes it difficult for the fiber to uh, to uh, break down the, uh, the line into that. So that pretty much does it for us today on uh, cabling. Uh, if you go into the uh, into the site, you will see there are a couple labs in there for you guys to do um, for this. Um, we have online labs, and then if we're meeting in face-to-face, -face, we'll be building our own uh, cables.